Mike Foot, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Dylan. So we were together about a month ago in Japan. Tell me about the the rest of the trip with the family there, because I know you guys moved around after our racing in the Kai 70K. How was the rest of the trip with Katie and Jack? Yeah, man. It was so good to see you over there. You and I had not caught up for a couple of years, so it was really good to hang out and we were able to share a couple of meals and uh, pretty much no time on the race course, unfortunately, because you're a lot faster than I am. But uh, yeah, it was a great trip. You know, both you and I have raced in Japan a little bit and love the culture over there. And uh, yeah, just got to experience uh, incredible food, which my wife loved and I appreciated, but am a little seafood squeamish because I grew up in the Midwest and was not exposed to anything beyond Van de Kemp's fish sticks uh, for the first 20 years of my life. <laughs> so I'm still to this day, unfortunately, not a huge lover of sushi and um, fish sauce in every single dish I have, yep. but uh, I know it's incredible. And yeah, uh, my wife and our one-year-old son, Jack, uh, came over with me and we got to have a fun week or so after the race, just jumping on bullet trains, exploring cities like Kyoto, going to old Buddhist shrines, uh, spending time in Tokyo, uh, which is one of the densest populated places I've ever been. And yet one of the least chaotic places I've ever been, which is such an interesting. Isn't that incredible? Juxtaposition. It is. It's, it's, it's absolutely bewildering. It's so be- <laughs> bewildering. One of the largest cities by population in the entire world. And there's just this, this amazing organization and tranquility to it at the same time. And if you juxtapose it to something like New York city or even San Francisco, it just like feels so much more peaceful. Oh yeah. I feel it there. And it's so, so noticeable and I appreciate it. It's it's yeah. really cool to be in in a place like that. You know, what's bizarre too, that I've noticed and that I've said to a couple of people, you know, if you go to New York city, everybody jaywalks, right? If there's no cars coming, even if the pedestrian walk sign is not illuminated, people still just cross the street, right? In Tokyo, if there's no cars within visibility, if that walk sign is not illuminated, nobody walks. And there's this sort of a culture of sort of respect, if not obedience that they have there um, that certainly is is not present in places like New York and San Francisco. But Oh, absolutely. Like, I love the chaos at times of U.S. culture. And I also love the orderliness of like there's like there's few things more cathartic than getting on a. Uh, like very busy escalator where 100% of the people who are standing stand on the right and 100% of the people that are walking walk on the left. Yeah. Uh, was, there's something weird about that. It's funny too. And we talked about this when we were in Japan, I think, but I had been so busy leading up to that trip. And one of the things that I experienced and that I experience every time I'm in Japan is just that like, I don't know, feeling of exhalation when you get there because there is that feeling of peace and tranquility across the entire country. And I had been so busy and stressed leading up to the trip that for three or four days, I just slept. I think the the vibes of, of that amazing country really seeped into my soul at a time when I needed it. And I ended up coming home feeling rested, even though I had to slog my way through a 70K race. Anyway, oh, I fully my- agree. It's so good to have you on the pod, buddy. And you and I go back a long way as we came into the sport about the same time. We're about the same age. We're both raising little boys now. So we have a lot that we can sort of connect on in this conversation. But I wanted to start with something that I've been doing with guests recently, just opening things up to help introduce uh, our guests recently. And that is just an introspective question of what makes you, you, what are your unique character traits that make Mike Foote the person that he is? Mm. I love that question. I, first of all, my knee jerk reaction is that there's absolutely nothing that makes me unique, (laughs) but there are, there are many things that definitely make me, me, uh, for better and for worse. Uh, yeah, I am arguably the most indecisive person you'll ever meet in your life. Uh, and yet at the same time, I am fully, fully committed once I get over the precipice of making a decision. So I spend a lot of time in, in that indecision yet and 
400% determined to see something through once I get to that point. Uh, I am, yeah, a, a very questioning, curious person. I don't have a lot of certainty in my life. Like I, I kind of joke that like the only true things I can say, the, the, the truest three words I can say, or I don't know, like I, I don't feel comfortable, like acting like I know something. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Like I really, it's like, such a good thing. It's such yeah. a good thing, especially yeah. in today's day and age where it's all about having a take and, you know, differentiating, your, uh, differentiating yourself or, or segmenting ourselves into these different groups that are often ideo ideologically driven admitting when we don't know or that admitting when things are complicated is actually a superpower isn't it oh man it's 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 something i strive towards i just feel like you can always ask better questions and ask better questions and that will get you closer to whatever truth is but i don't know if there's ever like i, I always try to stay on that side of the equation versus the answer side of the equation and I think it leaves me open to different ideas and experiences. And I mean, obviously I have opinions. Like I find myself like wanting to become attached to things and then realize that that's not healthy. And so, yeah, living on that kind of questioning side of things has really been a good process for me. What about the indecisiveness? How does that show up in your life? Oh man. I mean, if I'm being honest, it's probably like based in some sort of anxiety and wanting to, like, you know, once you decide on something, you have to be committed to that thing. And like I said, once I commit to something, I'm all in. So it's it's like high consequence. Um, I, I, I respond well to ultimatums. You can ask my my uh, wife, Katie, that, uh, you know, after like seven years of dating, she was like, buddy, it's, it's, it's now or never. And I'm like, OK, OK, I remember. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad that I did. Today is our fourth year anniversary actually which is kind of funny no way happy yeah. anniversary buddy amazing yeah, yeah, well, well tell her thank you for allowing you to do a podcast with me on your anniversary yeah she's at work you know so it's good timing <laughs> um well yeah awesome man well thanks for sharing that stuff and yeah who knows maybe we'll come back to talking a little bit more about it and how those character traits of maybe been strengths and weaknesses during your athletic career. As I said, you and I sort of came into the sport around the same time. We've known each other a long time. We were teammates for a while. We're about the same age. And before we go back in time, I'd love to kind of hear where you're at with your running right now. Like to what extent is being a great athlete still a priority of yours? Oh man, <laughs> straight to the hardest questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and I, you and I could probably talk a lot about this. Uh, hmm. I feel like being a great athlete, that that definition has probably changed for me. I think it has to at times. And I think that's healthy. Like uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, being a great athlete meant standing on the podiums of the biggest races in the world. And that was, you know, my sole focus and my sole reason for getting out the door. And, um, you know, for a lot of years, I was doing that once or twice a year and it was great. And, um, you know, I'm 39 now, uh, I have been ultra running. This is crazy to think about Dylan, but this is my 15th season of signing up for running at least one ultra in the year, which is Same. just bonkers yeah. to think about uh, and really dates me. <laughs> um, and, you know, if I'm being honest, like uh, the results haven't come as easily in the last handful of years, but my, and that's for a variety of reasons, you know, I've, I've been open about mental health struggles. I mean, I've just had a variety of injuries that people deal with, you know, when they've been in the game for so long. Uh, I've had, professional successes outside of running that have taken a lot of my life capacity away from my training. You know, I have a growing events business. Um, I'm really involved like in with a lot of volunteer work where I live here in Missoula, Montana. As we mentioned earlier, I now have a one and a half year old son who uh, I may or may not have a cold from right now, <laughs> which happens about once a month. Uh, you know, things that used to happen like once every two years are, are yeah. like <laughs> very common now. So like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just different. And 
I, you know, maybe it's me justifying things or trying to reframe narratives in order to like feel relevant still. But I, sure. I don't know. I don't know about you, but for me, it's like, I'm as invested in the sport as I've ever been. And I have great opportunities to, um, tell really interesting stories. Uh, I get to go do really fun adventures in the mountains, which has always kind of been something that's important to me is, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even more so in recent years is like doing fun adventures in the mountains that aren't pace based or results based. And yet to me are still really interesting and engaging. Um, I can still show up to races, have a great time, push myself as hard as I can. And if I don't end up on the podium, you know, that's, that is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I have the opportunity to be like a mentor to up and coming trail runners in the sport, which is really fun for me. and something I take a lot of joy in, whether it's folks like Adam Peterman here in Missoula or other folks who have joined the North face team. Um, so yeah, I'm in a weird way. I feel like I'm as ingrained and enmeshed and, uh, engaged in like the community slash sport as I've ever been, but it's been in like a much more multifaceted way in yeah. recent years. And again, like maybe I'm doing all this in order to like feel some like ground under my feet. <laughs> it's it's sure, yeah. like the results aren't there, but it feels yeah. good. It feels right. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, do I wake up every day wanting to like be better and be fast and all those things? Yes. Is it do. a much more like rocky or like up and down roller coaster than it used yeah. to be? Yes. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly 15 years goes, isn't oh, it? Man. I remember thinking like, I could just do this for five years. Me and then five years came and went. I'm like, well, eight, well now 10, now 12. You just keep moving the goalposts, like, you know, a couple more years out from wherever yeah. you are. And yeah. here we are. <laughs> I, I remember I'm 37 now. And I remember because Harmony and I, got together when I was about 25. And I remember we were having some sort of argument about me being committed to running and like a trip that I was going on. I was like, listen, like realistically, I've got like four or five more years of this sort of like putting the, the, the finish line at age 30, right. And here yeah. we are, seven years later. And I feel exactly the same. Like I've never been more committed, more ingrained, and uh, more in love with the sport, even though things have changed so much. What about your What about your body? Because I remember during the pandemic, you and Katie came over to our place in Portland, and we were just catching up in the backyard. And I was actually you and I had a beer, and and Katie would passed on the beer, and then uh, revealed that you guys were expecting, which of course was a great thing to celebrate. But um. I re recall you saying something in my backyard when we were just talking about running and stuff. And you're like, man, I've been on a journey recently. And <laughs> I know you're still kind of battling the body a little bit. So maybe talk about that and, and maybe how the physicality of things has been changing now in our late thirties. Cause I'm sure we're both feeling that too. Oh, the journey is real. Yeah. The timing, you were some of the first people we told we were pregnant just due to the timing of that trip. And uh, yeah, that was great. That was a really fun night we spent. And that was the first time I met Ryan Thrower, who now is a good friend and just love that guy. Yeah. I, I digress. Um, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is just in the last few years, I've really, well, four years now, I've been dealing just with chronic knee pain and that manifested with initially patellar tendonitis and then evolved into uh, just general patellofemoral pain, which, you know, upon getting an MRI showed, you know, just cartilage wear, some beginnings of arthritis, uh, <clears throat> nothing severe yet, you know, maybe something that was in line with the pain I was feeling. And that journey has been definitely really, really hard because it, it, it put me in a spot where I felt like I essentially since in the last four years, I'm just constantly managing and, and trying to overcome and trying to just build back as much capacity as I can to, to work with what I got. And, you know, I have, I have good seasons and bad seasons over that time, but the general progression has been good. Um, I'll say one thing about getting an MRI is I'm not sure I recommend it. Uh, I, I don't think it gave me information that changed what I should have done to address it. And if anything, it just made me think I had a quote unquote bad knee. Um, and I think that 
pain is a really interesting thing and pain is associated with stories you tell yourself. And I was told a story that like I had a bad knee and I, I just remember that that's when the pain got even worse. And I swear that it was a psychological component to it. And, um, you know, today, like I can train pretty hard. I definitely can't train like I could have 10 years ago, uh, probably for a variety of reasons that I mentioned before, but also just due to like, if I do, my knee will get pretty flared up. But two years ago, I essentially didn't even have a season in 2021 because I was really working through. And that's, you know, when we saw you, uh, and you know, this year I'm feeling pretty healthy. I've done an ultra. I hope to do a couple more this season, though. I haven't decided on what yet because of in what I mentioned years. earlier in this <laughs> podcast. Um, well, I mean, I have like, you know, a short list of races I'm interested in, but also mountain adventures and just trying to time it all out with events I'm organizing and you know how it goes, like schedule gets full and, yeah. um, but anyways, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I have like 10 friends who are physical therapists. I have seen a physical, th- seen physical therapists on and off over the years. I doing all the strength training, all the work and, you know, it's, it's, it's worked over time. Uh, and I'm in a spot now where I can, I can make big plans and probably execute on them. I just have to be really, really, really smart to get yeah. to the start line and not overdo it and rest and recover and, you know, it's, I'm not always perfect about it, but I'm, I found a path forward that like, oh yeah, I can still like physically participate in the sport in a way that I love. And that's like really exciting to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny to kind of look back at the training I was doing in my late twenties, early thirties and stuff. And just being like, wow, I was so committed. <laughs> I put in <laughs> such solid work and and now you do have to be so surgical and so mindful of your body and of your time outside of running too. And, but it does, I think maybe give you a deeper appreciation for the hours that we get out on the trails and especially those fleeting moments where it seems to click and you get a glimmer of your younger self, but absolutely. uh, I'm fascinated too, about that, like psychosomatic pain element too, because I deal with a back issue that I'm convinced is like a stress related thing. In fact, I I read a book about how there's a theory that much of back pain is, is mostly like associated with psychological stress. And well, you've, you've probably read the research or it was probably in that book, which essentially shows like you can take 50 people, take an MRI of their back. 20 of those people might have look, look on the MRI, like they should be in absolute utter pain and they're not. And then vice versa, you have people who have a lot of back pain whose backs look good and healthy. And yeah. it's, I think it's, it's so, so interesting. And yeah, I think pain, pain science is like such a fun space to research and read about. Yeah. I have an uncle who's sort of like a big criminal, criminal defense attorney, mm. and he's had back surgery twice at least. And of course, the other research that's pretty convincing is how rarely back surgeries are successful. And I know like Steve Kerr, who's the coach of the Golden State Warriors, oh, yeah. has advised anybody like don't get back surgery unless it's absolutely needed. And um, yeah, I don't know. When I talk to my uncle about it, I ask, you know, like, does your back flare up when you're in the heat of litigation he was like a hundred percent and it's the same for me you know, like my my back gets bad when i get stressed anyway it's do, do you it's, feel do you feel it um leading into i feel like many many people who listen to this podcast might have like these aches and pains that flare up like right before a race that then just like disappear as soon as the gun goes off yeah i mean occasionally um anyway i, I yeah. think uh, we can armchair expert our uh various, <laughs> various maladies uh on some other conversation but I think our, our audience would probably love to hear a little bit more about your story and i, I want to get around to eventually talking about one of the things that you mentioned that is like mentoring and observing this next generation but before we get there maybe we could go back and and just talk about that as it applied to your career right like you and i've been in the sport for 15 years now like 
and it was sort of an interesting time when we came into the sport. So maybe you could share who some of your early mentors were, who are some of the people you were observing, who you were inspired by, who helped to indoct- indoctrinate you into the community. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I started ultra running when I moved to Missoula, Montana, where I, where I live now uh, to finish up my undergrad in environmental studies here in Missoula. And I guess I actually moved up to Glacier National Park, was a raft and hiking guide up there for a handful of years, ski patroller in the winter. Um, Started just doing more and more big adventures in the mountains and loving it. And learned about ultra running uh, just as as a trail runner, just wasn't interested in it at all. And uh, yet, cross paths with this guy, Mike Wolf, who, you know, uh, is a dear friend of mine and somebody who took me under his wing. He was a North face athlete at the time, uh, like national champion, hundred miler, like done all these big races, incredible, just general mountain athlete, uh, who legend, legend, absolute, absolute legend. Who a lot of the the younger, <laughs> younger athletes who've come into the sport recently probably have no idea who he was. Cause he was never on, you know, like, yeah. Cause he doesn't care about social media and he's kind of got a chip on his shoulder in like such a like endearing way <laughs> and <laughs> like to do things a little counterculturally. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he was, he's a total stud and very much inspired me. And I remember I'd be like, Hey, can I go for a run with you? Can I like come over and hang out? Can I just like be in your presence so that I know what this ultra running thing is? And uh yeah, I, we we kind of clicked and connected. And he ended up pacing me at the first time I did hard rock, which was 2010, my second 100 miler. And you know, I, I think I got third that year. And he's like, Man, we got to get you on the North Face team. And uh, you know, one thing led to another, and after uh, me reaching out to the North face and then politely declining a couple of times. They, they finally reached out to me after I had a great race at UTMB a couple of years later. And yeah, Mike, Mike was a great, uh, mentor because, uh, he had a real love for the, the sport and a love for just getting out and doing the hard things. And, uh, he had a tendency to overdo it at times. And I think I probably learned that from him too, (laughs) but, uh, you know, he, he was at the same time. I mean, 100% the reason I got into it. And I think it's important to see people. Um, there's something that's really empowering about seeing somebody do it. And then you're like, well, if they can do it, maybe I can do it. And you kind of learn a little bit about their tactics or how like their process and you try and mimic it. And then you learn a little bit about what works for you and what doesn't. But yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I would have gotten into the sport if it weren't for him. Yeah. It's so funny. And I didn't put this together until now, but he was also instrumental in getting me connected with the North face and on the North face team too. So I didn't know that it's a pretty powerful thing too, right? Like, because that was probably a life-changing thing for both of us, or at least helped us to take the next step in our careers. And oftentimes it does take somebody vouching for you, endorsing your personal character and your capabilities on the race course in order for a brand to recognize you or to put that faith and trust in you. And so big gratitude yeah. to, to Mike Wolf for helping us both out in our careers. And your point about him being sort of like, a, I don't know, contrarian or counterculture type person, I recall it, North Face Athlete Summits on principle, he just wouldn't wear North Face product. You know? <laughs> everybody would be decked out in like PNF puffies and t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. And, and footy, I, I, uh, Mike Wolf would like sleep outside under the stars and he'd be like walking around in like a Carhartt hoodie, <laughs> like just the only Wranglers in a Carhartt hoodie. <laughs> like, oh, everybody's wearing TNF. I got to wear something else. <laughs> yeah. That hasn't changed. <laughs> Shout out Wolf Paw. So maybe let's talk about this next generation now. And eventually we'll get around to talking about the film. But in the film, you know, Jen Lichter is um a, a character or is a part of this adventure that you put together. Also in your hometown in Missoula, there's Adam Peterman, Jeff Mogavero, um, Aaron Clark. You know, there's this great young crop of athletes coming into the sport now who probably view you as a mentor. So maybe there's any thoughts that you have about the next generation you could use any of them as specific examples and what makes them special or what has you excited about this new group? 
Oh man, it's a really cool time here in Missoula, uh, having all the people you just mentioned and just so many strong runners here right now. And it definitely feels like the next generation. I mean, obviously Adam is doing, uh, is just, you know, off the charts, talented and incredible. And he and I go further back than anybody because I coached him in high school, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Aaron Clark just won Lake Sonoma 50 Jen, uh, who's a North face athlete. She's been, uh, just such a good addition to town and, and so great. And yeah, I, I think that a couple of things come to mind. One is like, they all have such good heads on their shoulders. Like, like they're all just healthy, smart people who are, you know, relatively well-rounded and interested in a lot of different things. And yet also are much more professional, uh, than I think I ever was in, in the sport. And like, take, like, think of like running as a career and think of running as like a way to make a living and a way to like, you know, uh, be, yeah, be a professional for many years to come. Whereas I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, it was like, all right, if, if, if you're making, if you're making money, you're in the very, very, you know, elite field of, of pro runners because the majority of people just got product. And so the, the resources that are available to them are, uh, are more, and that's a great thing. And I'm, I'm very in support of that. And, uh, yeah, it's, and at the same time, it's like, maybe there's a little bit more pressure with that too. And they feel a little bit more pressure, but, uh, it's great because there's a, and, and I know like Missoula is not unique, but I, I always think that Missoula has such a great, does like this community is so great. Like we all run together. I mean, it's not uncommon that everybody that you just named, goes for a group run. Like we do some like Tuesday morning runs and it's like, we all hang out and we're all friends and like, we support each other and we make each other better. And, um, you know, Jeff McGavro and I just got a long run in the other day and, um, yeah, I mean, just, it's, it's really fun to like talk to them about what races they're choosing and why and how their training's going and, um, talking a little bit of inside baseball with like their, you know, what it's like to be a professional athlete, all yeah. that stuff. And, and I'm just like the, the old guy on the bench, like just not, not disseminating advice because again, going back to like, I don't feel like I know anything, but I can share experiences and ask questions that like helps them think about things in different ways. And it's really fun. Do you find yourself sort of taking on that mentor role sort of helping them think about race schedule, calendar construction, sponsor interfacing and engagement, things like that? Yeah. In, in, in a, an unofficial way. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, I just have a lot of experience <laughs> having been in the, in it for so long. And, uh, at the same time, like, I would never say like, do this, don't do that. But I do like, again, I'll, I love having those conversations with them and, and hearing what they're working through and how they're managing things. I mean, you know, whether it's injuries they're going through or whatever, and, uh, absolutely. I like want to be an open door to them. And, and we, we do have those conversations a lot. It really is fun, isn't it? I mean, I, right? find, I find so much joy in that, you know, and I've now by virtue of having the podcast and things like that, just a lot of people reach out and ask about a lot of the young pros. I mean, reach out and, and ask advice on a lot of stuff. And man, it brings me a ton of joy in the same way we were just talking about with Mike Wolf, sort of giving us a platform from which to grow a career. It feels good to sort of, you know, pass that knowledge down to the next generation too. And yeah, observe just how great they are, how professional they are, how, you know, mature and um, yeah, just like healthy they are, you know, and, and actually, <laughs> do you, do you have, I, I'm just so curious. I, uh, I assume you, you do have these conversations a lot. Like what's like one general piece of advice you're given the next generation of runners, especially at that like level that are trying to make a go at it. I mean, when, when it comes to the sponsor conversation, I think oftentimes it's lost on younger people in general. And it's certainly something that it took me a while to appreciate that when you're, when you're talking to a brand, for example, you always have to be able to show how, or at least be able to explain how your presence is going to be valuable or net beneficial to the brand, right? Like they're not right. in the business of philanthropy, at least as it relates to their athlete teams. And so 
finding ways that you can be unique, be differentiated, be successful on the race course, but also like, you know, we were talking about with Mike Wolf, develop great relationships, make sure that people that you have a positive reputation in the community that people want to go for a run with you, but that you're also doing something that ties back to creating value for the company. And, you know, I think that's something that, you know, when I was coming up, it was all like, well, I've, you know, finished on the podium at X, Y, and Z race, you know, like yeah. give me a paycheck and a pair of shoes. And it's like, well, like, how does that podium actually drive awareness and value and sales? Yep. For brand. And so thinking about, you know, the actual practical business side of things, I think is important, you know, starting a career in the sport. And I think one of the reasons why it took me a while to understand that stuff is because developing a quote unquote career in the sport when you and I were coming up wasn't realistic. Right. And that sort of, we, we've yeah. sort of lived through that changing of the guard where now the top tier pros can actually just be professional runners which is an amazing evolution it's so cool yeah and it happened fast <laughs> it <did. laughs> it's really cool so i want to talk about adam specifically because he's been on the podcast twice and both times we've talked at length about you so i'd love to give you a chance to talk about him you mentioned that you guys have had a long relationship going back to when you were coaching him in high school i'd love to hear you just talk about what it's been like to observe him going from that great high school athlete now to be in Western States champion, world champion. I'm sure you carry a lot of pride. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> outside of, uh, Lisa and Larry Adams parents <laughs> who I hang out with socially because we're, <laughs> we're, we're really close. Uh, I think I'm like his third, probably biggest fan in the world. Uh, having just seen him just, Ever since, I mean, I still remember the first day I met him freshman year, high school, my first year as a cross country coach at Hellgate High School here in Missoula, his first year on the team and, uh, you know, seeing him grow and become a leader and be very successful at that, you know, cross country and track level and in high school and then going on to racing in Colorado for the buffs and Boulder and, you know, you know, finding like having a lot of highs and lows, a lot of challenge, a lot of injury, a lot, a lot of like not being anywhere near his potential. And, you know, this through line from the day I met him to today is his love of just like doing fun adventures in the mountains. And that's something I really align with as well. Like he, he has this, like, whether competition's going well or not, well, he still just finds joy in being outdoors, whether it's fly fishing or doing some like big gravel bike ride or like hiking the same peak over every one month, every year. And all these like fun little challenges he sets for himself that, you know, you can just see like deep down his like joy for being outside and like pushing himself is like such a good reservoir for him to pull from when he is competing at the world champs or, at, you know, the last 20 miles of Western States. And you know, I, I mean, I think of Adam a lot when I think, when I said this, like next generation has such like good heads on their shoulders. They're so like, Adam is one of the most like just mentally stable people I know. And, uh, just like generally in good spirits and positive thinking and, uh, you know, just he, I mean, he's having a really big struggle right now because he just did not, or he, just found out last week as a sacral stress fracture. And I think he just shared it a day or two ago publicly and that's really hard. And, you know, he's not going to manage everything perfectly and uh, he's having a hard time right now, but I, I will say like sometimes injuries like this can really crush people. And I have like all the confidence in the world that Adam's going to be like, well, I screwed up and here's <laughs> what I'm going to do to fix it. And I'm going to learn from this and I'll be better for it. And uh, you know, again, he'll have highs and lows along this, like, um, like this journey of, of recovery from this injury. And, but at the same time, like there's very few people I'd be more confident to be like, well, yeah, he's going to be set back for a little bit, but he'll be totally fine because he has all these like, you know, hard skills and soft skills to get over something like this. So, yeah. yeah and, and I mean, he's mentioned this on the podcast as well when he was on, but like he works for the events company we have. And so I get to see Adam uh, socially all the time, but also professionally like he's he's a hard worker he's like really good at 
getting things done. He's uh, it's reliable. You don't. He's have- reliable. You like. You know. I mean. It's like he's like really good with people. Like I don't know. I'm just like a huge fan of him. And yeah. like I mean, there's there's nobody I want to su- see succeed more. You know, he's yeah. he's uh, he's just a great guy. When he when he posted about his stress fracture, he said something to the effect of "It's all part of the story" or something, which sort of gave it this air of optimism, even at a moment where obviously he would be experiencing a lot of disappointment. I know if. I had that when I was 27 and the defending Western States champion, I would be crushed emotionally. Right. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's one of the things he and I talked about a lot on the podcast and that you and I have talked about privately is just like, yeah, the stability that he has emotionally. And this will be something that will test that stability. And it's, it is all part of the story. It is all part of the journey. And it's something that every athlete goes through at some point is just one of these devastating moments of, you know, failure of your body but anyway he's yeah. great he's lucky to have uh, a great community in missoula and a, mm-hmm. and a great long-term mentor and boss in, in <laughs> yeah um hey let's talk about this video because um this is sort of one of the things that inspired us to, to do the podcast now i've been bugging you hey we got to get do a podcast soon and we came to the mutual decision that we would wait until this new video came out um, that the North Face just published on our YouTube channel. So maybe just quickly for those who haven't seen it, it's called Shining Mountains. So just maybe give the the quick synopsis of what the spirit of the film is. What's it about? Yeah. So Shining Mountains is uh, a short film highlighting and documenting a trip that Jen for Lichter, North Face trail running athlete, also living here in Missoula, who we mentioned earlier, uh, she, uh, myself and a good friend of mine, Stephen Nam, who's a incredible adventure photographer, mountain athlete, done a lot of stuff for national geographic, uh, North face as well. The three of us, uh, planned a trip to visit the remaining 26 glaciers in Glacier National Park. Uh, Yeah, about 150 years ago, there was over 150 glaciers in the park. You know, there's 26 remaining. They're all shrinking. Uh, You know, this is not really news to anybody. It's something that's been covered in in spades uh, over recent years. But uh, that place is is very central to my story, Jen's story, and Stephen's story. Stephen grew up there. Jen and I, in our early adult life, kind of came of age in the mountains in in the area in and around Glacier National Park. Both Jen and I have guided there. Uh, It's a place that's one of my, you know, true norths. Uh, I've done a lot of adventuring there. And probably four or five years ago, I just had this seed of a thought of, hey, it'd be interesting to visit the remaining glaciers of the park and be a really interesting way to move through that landscape. Uh, they're all incredibly remote. It's like a national park yet zero, like one of the 26 glaciers has a trail to it. Um, the other 25 are, uh, you know, to be frank, a pain in the ass to get to, <laughs> um, they're all, they've all like receded in these high alpine basins that you can't really take a ridgeline to get to them. You can't go up the valley to get to them. You have to like side hill through technical terrain to get into and out of these places. And so, uh, yeah, I, I really just thought, wow, that'd be a really interesting thing to do. And, you know, maybe in the next 30, 40 years, a lot of these, you know, big hunks of ice won't even exist anymore. And so it's an interesting time, uh, to visit them. And while we're at it, let's add to this archive of, uh, repeat photography that's kind of showcased the recession of these glaciers uh, that's been going for about 130 years now. And it's something that the USGS is uh, has done for, like I said, a really long time. And they've kind of moved to uh, more aerial imagery to showcase these things. And yet at the same time, we thought it'd be really cool to repeat a lot of photos that are done on the ground. And like I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to get to these places. And so we were repeating photos that haven't been done in decades. And so it was really interesting to like get to these places, bring this human perspective to it and, and document, uh, the glaciers along the way. And yeah, it was like a two week trip, uh, lots of shenanigans, adversity, adventure along the way. And yeah, we made a short film about it and, you know, 
I'll say one thing. It's, it's I just spent a lot of time talking about melting glaciers, but of course it's it's a film that is about climate change, but it's also about celebrating a landscape, celebrating places you love, and hopefully sparking curiosity for people to get out and explore places they love. And um, I think that's like a great, great um, first step to maybe wanting to protect and care for a place. So that's also like a central theme within the the film. And I don't think it's a climate despair film at all. I think there's a lot of joy, celebration and humor in the film. So if people are like, you know what, I don't want to down or 16 minutes of my life today. I promise you there's, there's laughter in it. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of like just breathtaking beauty and camaraderie and overcoming challenge and a lot of other narratives that I think are just as important. So yeah, I'm really happy with how, uh, how the film came out. Yeah. It seems like the theme of our conversation here today is change, right? We talk about aging as athletes, <laughs> having kids and now talking about the melting of these ancient glaciers. I'd love for you to go deeper on this repeat photography thing because it's something that I'm genuinely, yeah, I'm just curious to hear like how you get access to those images that are shown in the film and like what, what the process was to ensure that you are repeating them accurately, how you find the right spots, et cetera. Yeah. So great question. We, uh, a lot of it is in just like the public records. You can, you can dig and find it. We did have a contact at USGS, uh, the West Glacier office, right. In, in Glacier Park, who, uh, essentially gave us a file of all, all of their, uh, um, repeat photography and, we were able to pick from there. Okay, this is a great shot that we can get to, and and kind of um, curate. Okay, these are the ones we want to repeat. We then went to Kinkos, printed off these huge pieces of paper, brought them out in the backcountry with us on this trip, and uh, and many even, of those photos are over a hundred years old. We should say, yes, yeah, yeah. Some as recent as like twenty or thirty years, but the majority are in the early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, and so. We, oh man, it was, it was tricky. Uh, it was one of these things where we're like, oh yeah, we'll like do these photos. It'll be fun, whatever. And it just became like the central purpose of the day. Cause it was so hard to get to the exact spot to get to the exact image. And, you know, sometimes it, it meant, okay, we've got to work our way out on this pretty precipitous slope, which I was always surprised where these photos were taken from, <laughs> um, in order to get this perfect shot of the glacier and like, and, and so we had some GPX points that we like plotted on a map that we thought were like generally where we needed to be. And we'd, we'd get there and then be like, oh, actually we probably got, got to go 200 more meters this way or whatever in order to get the shot. And yeah, it took up a lot of time, but it was really, uh, yeah, it was a really interesting and unique way to move through a landscape and a really great purpose to have to the day. And you, you sort know, of were we, adding to the story. Yourself. Oh, totally. You're contributing to this archive, which probably brings a sense of satisfaction too. It, it did. And uh, yeah. And, and obviously going out there, holding up these hundred year old photos and then looking beyond them to what there is today, it's stark. I mean, it's not like super fun <laughs> to see, but it's also, yeah, there's, there's purpose behind it. It's important to tell those stories and again, a lot of these photos hadn't been taken for so long and it takes like a really unique skill set to kind of day after day move through like these big chunks of land, uh, complex terrain. You need like the ability to do that, the ability to just have endurance to do it day after day. And so in a weird way, it's like utilizing this like ultra running skill set we have to, uh, contribute to these archives and, also explore places we love. Like I've spent a ton of time in Glacier. I've done a lot of really cool things in that park. And the majority of the places we visited on this trip were new to me because of, yeah, it, there was no reason to go up to this like basin and bushwhack our way a full day up to take a photo of a glacier before. And then suddenly we're doing that and trying to like link a route that made sense from one end of the park to the other was really tricky, but also like a fun puzzle to solve. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was challenging and fulfilling at the same time. Very, very cool. Well, I'll make sure to link in the show notes to 
this film and shout out to Ethan Newberry, who our listeners will be very familiar with. He's the one who it seems like put, put the film together with footage that you guys captured. Yeah. After. So make sure you guys go check that out. And I think, yeah, to echo your sentiment, you sort of say in the film, I think sort of at the end, being conflicted as to whether this is a eulogy or a love song, like a eulogy for the death of these glaciers or a love song for the national park and the ability to, to be out there. And I think while well, you feel that tension, it, it's definitely not a downer. And I think this is a good place to sort of start talking about some of the advocacy work and conservation work that you do. Actually, you and I were texting the other day um, about trail culture and you were, you were mentioning that this was something that you maybe wanted to explore together on the podcast. And I just so happened to be sort of writing our definition down in an effort to sort of hold ourselves accountable to our values here at free trail. So, uh, maybe opening the door to that conversation, like what is, what does trail culture mean to you at this point? Well, first of all, I thought the timing was amazing that you were in the midst of writing that article, which I had a chance to read. And, um, you know, I think I think about trail culture all the time. I know that it's a huge part of the free trail message and I appreciate it. And that's why I was like, oh, man, I'd love to know more specifically what you what you think about when you think about trail culture. Um, you know, I'm hesitant to like have a uh, like a perfect definition of it. I think that it's okay for culture to shift and change and for us not to hold on to what trail running culture as a whole was 20 years ago and say, that's what it has to be. Because of course that's not the case. Like the tent's getting bigger, more people are coming into it. That's a good thing. And at the same time, it's like, okay, but what are the things about trail culture that should be through lines from 20 years ago to 20 years in the future that we all can agree are like need to be a part of this. And that's the reason that that's what makes this so special. That's why people are coming into this sport. That's why people are staying. That's why people are advocating for it. And, um, you know, I think you had four tenets. I honestly can't remember them all, but for me, I, I remember being like, Oh, I love that you put in stewardship. I love that you put in like caring for the places we love. And, you know, I, uh, and I, I think you had inclusivity in there, which I mean, I'll say, like, I think that's amazing. I think that we need to have open arms for everybody that wants to come into this sport. Um, but the the stewardship side is something that I have really uh, been drawn to in, in, you know, the last handful of years. And of course, we all have places where we feel a sense of belonging, places that nourish us, places that, you know, help us maintain sanity where we train all the above. And I think that as, and then like within this, within the sport of trail running and within trail culture, I think that it's so important to continue to have conversations around, okay, how do we take care of these places? How do we give back whether financially or with sweat equity or advocating on behalf of those places? I think it's so important to uh, have that be a central theme in our culture and our community. And and it is here and there, um, but I just, I continue to think it can be more, more front and center. And I think that pers my personal journey is such that like, I feel better when I am taking, when I'm like giving back to the places that give me so much. And it's like the cyclical relationship that builds upon itself. And I, I get more excited about being out in that landscape because I know more about its history and I, and I'm contributing to its health however I can. Again, it doesn't always have to be just like, financially, but it's, yeah, what organizations are taking care of that place? How do you support them? Are you advocating for them? Are you just giving them a monthly or annual donation? Are you rolling up your sleeves and like going to a weed pool or a trail building or whatever it is? Um, you know, I think, I think that really goes a long way and that connection to place and that connection to land is so for lack of a better word, grounding. Um, and, uh, it's, and I just think that, yeah, as, as trail running just like explodes in popularity, like if that theme can stay a part of it, I think it's so important. And like, yeah, I'm going to go just a little bit further here. The, like a handful of years ago, I went to like a public lands rally in Helena, Montana to like the, the Capitol and was like standing alongside hunters and anglers and mountain bikers and all these like user groups that we're like really advocating for public access and conservation, and all this stuff. And 
there wasn't many trail runners there at the time I noticed. And I, I wrote an article in trail runner again, years ago about that, that gained a little traction and essentially saying like, we, as trail runners, we kind of have it pretty good. We like ride on the backs of a lot of the work other user groups do to like take care of places, have access to places because they've got to work hard to get through red tape. Whereas we were pretty light on the land relatively because we're just out running. Um, I know some people would argue that's not true, but it, it's it's <laughs> it's different than some other uh, other user groups. And anyways, the point being like, we we actually have to hold ourselves accountable because we don't have to like go through a bunch of different uh, bits of red tape to like, allow for mountain bikes per se to get into an area or whatever. And so because we have it so easy, we just have to hold ourselves accountable. We need to be talking about it within our community. And um, of course, like many of us are, but I just hope that that's something we continue to do. And as people come into the sport, they're like, oh yeah, okay. I'm a trail runner now. I also have to give back to these places that I spend all my time in and that I love. And um, yeah, if we can like perpetuate that forward, uh, trail running can save the world, Dylan. (laughs) yeah i mean very well said and um i can't pretend to get out and do like as much trail work as i probably should and i think you're right in a general sense that trail runners do coast off the backs of a lot of these organizations that spend hours and hours of you know manpower out sweating swinging axes and uh shovels out on the trails and, you know, um, our partners on Gorge, Jeremy and Aaron Long from Daybreak Racing, they do tons of tons of trail work. And they speak about how much joy and satisfaction it brings to them, right? And in the instances where I've done trail work, I feel that also, you know, just like how satisfying it is to sort of like tend to those ribbons of dirt through the woods and sort of have like the same spirit we were talking about with Japan of just like tranquility and peace and satisfaction of just like not only a hard day's work, but just like being outside. And I think, you know, for those of us who can acknowledge that we can do more, I think uh, it, yeah, it's not a one-way street too. You know, you get a lot of satisfaction from putting that work in too. Um, I want to talk about the rut too, you know, (laughs) this is an incredible phenomenon now that you sort of brought into the world. I think it's like the 10 year anniversary this year. Is that right? Yeah. This is our 11th edition. So yeah. 10th anniversary since the first, yeah. First go of it. Yeah. So so maybe if you could just provide a quick uh, origin story of the event and, and also just any comments you have in general as sort of like an independent race director on the event landscape right now, you know, with a lot of this consolidation with UTMB and Golden Trail and Spartan, et cetera. Obviously, the rut is one of the most popular, you know, uh, biggest races in North America, and it still exists sort of like as an independent entity. So anything you want to say about this last 10, 11 years of working on the rut? Um, and anything you want to add about being an independent race director in this current era? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, it's become a big part of my professional life. I mean, we'll have, so the rut is a, uh, kind of mountain running three day celebration we have in big sky, Montana every fall, uh, in September with distances, everything from a a VK and 11 K all the way up to a 50 K, uh, again, over, over three days of like, yeah, just, uh, three days of festivities, festivities. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think we're at 3,800 runners this year. So it's massive. It's turned into a massive, massive event (laughs) and, and therefore is like a year round part-time job. And in the weeks leading into it is very much over, over a full-time job and it's wonderful. It's so cool. Uh, yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I'll bring up Mike Wolf again. He and I co-founded it back in 2013. Uh, both, both of us were, were racing professionally over in Western Europe a lot, uh, going to big races there. And, and of course, like acknowledging like something that's <clears throat> everybody knows today, like, wow, they're well ahead of us over in Europe. Like they celebrate the sport at the next, at the next level. And they have courses that are just insane. It's like, how can we bring a little bit of that back home to Montana? And 
you know, after like a year of just like chatting about it, we actually did have a good conversation with Big Sky Resort and were able to put together um, what felt like at the time a really unique mountain course that was incredibly challenging. Felt like a lot of the sky running events we were doing over in Europe um, with kind of major infrastructure at the base. So it wasn't this like quiet hundred person forest service trailhead, you know, <laughs> trail race, which I love, but you know, just a different iteration of what we could do with a trail running event in the U S and yeah, we, I mean, it's sold out every year. Uh, and then we just grow it bit by bit by bit, adding different distances, upping our caps. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's grown into this massive event. Uh, and I love it. It's super stressful. You know, this as a, as a race director, how hard it is to put on an event and all the details and the fact that you can always be doing more until the gun goes off and, and there's never like, okay, we're all done. We can just sit on our haunches now. It's like, there's always stuff to do. And, um, but creating experiences for people is really fun and, uh, there's a creative process to it. And it's always fun to think of ways to do it better. And, uh, I, I take a lot of pride in like gathering people in an actual physical space together to like be in community with one another, to do hard things together. And that's, again, it's hard, but it's also really rewarding to have that. Um, yeah. And I mean, I'm happy to speak to the independent nature of it. Like we used to be a world sky running series event for a few years. Uh, over time, we just felt like it wasn't a great partnership. It just it felt like the sky running brand, which, which I, you know, appreciate and respect just wasn't gaining traction in the U S in the way that I thought it would. And, um, you know, for the last handful of years, we've just been unaffiliated, you know, the North base is our title sponsor and they bring a ton of resources. And, um, again, the event has grown into you, you, you're, you have encyclopedic knowledge of trail running. Is there a larger participation wise trail running event in the U S that you're aware of? So. I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. I, I, always, I always say we're one of the largest, but I have no idea. <laughs> I think canyons is probably big but i i would guess it's half the size yeah of the rut gorge is about 1200 runners which i think is pretty big yeah most of the races but 3800 that's a that's a massive event i think T, the old tnf 50 rest in right. peace it was about <laughs> 5000 over two days so wow. i would say yeah. it's one of if not the biggest races maybe i mean you must be proud though mike because I, and I haven't been to your race yet, which I'm embarrassed to. Admit. I know we've joked about this many times over the oh, years. <laughs> come and volunteer this year. Maybe I'll race. Um, but like, for example, I mean, how many people are walking around right now with the rut tattoos on their bodies? Like everybody I speak to says it's like one of the greatest races in the world. And they just glow about their experiences there, which must bring you a ton of joy. So maybe reflect on that. And if there's, if you have a count as to how many tattoos there are in the world, <laughs> I'd love to hear it. That's a great question. So eight or nine years ago, we were like, wouldn't it be funny to just give out free rut tattoos at the race? Um, if you're unfamiliar, there's like, like this little logo with like elk antlers. Uh, and so people get the elk antlers. Few, a few people actually get the rut text as well, but most people just get the antlers, which I think is pretty classy. Um, we thought that we'd get one or two people to sign up for a free rut tattoo. And we'd give them free entry to the rut the following year. That year, 30 or 40 people signed up for the rut tattoo. And we decided we're no longer giving free entries to the rut the following year, <laughs> but we kept the tattoos around and, you know, we just have a suggested donation. We have a tattoo artist who lives in big sky who comes up and he just gives out ink all weekend long. Is it, and isn't he busy? Isn't it like standing room only in his tent or at least like his schedule is packed the whole weekend, just doling out it, tattoos. I'll, I'll wake up early in the morning. I'm not making this up. I'll wake up early in the morning before the race, like, you know, on race day, say for the 50 K and I like, it's like really dark out. And I'm like, in the base area, like getting ready before it gets busy. I'm like, why are there 40 people standing in line right now? And it's like 6 a.m. and it's all the 28 Kers who are like going to get their rut tattoo from the day before. <laughs> it's insane. We have like hundreds of people signing up every year. We can't can't get to them all. 
And it's like, people get mad. Like I didn't get my red tattoo. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. It's like this yeah, free thing we thought would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. like, you need to manage it better. And I'm like, I know, but at the same time, like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like we can't keep up with the demand. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's the the, the hilarious next step to this, Mike, is to have a lottery for the test. <laughs> <laughs> you have to collect your yeah. We could we could have uh, oh my it gosh yeah, this, like the western states of uh, the golden ticket of getting the red <laughs> tattoo. Yeah, no, there's there's a scarcity to it for sure. But it, it's it's turned into a thing, and it's not uncommon for me to just be out on the trail and see somebody with a red tattoo on their calf or shoulder or something. And it, it always brings me so much joy and I stop and talk to them. And um, yeah, it's definitely turned into a thing well bigger than I am. And I, I kind of love that. Like more people know about the rep than about me at this point. And I'm, I'm really happy about what it's become. And um, yeah, it's, it's a hell of a process, but it's also incredibly rewarding. Well, Mike, we got to start winding down now. I have about a million other things I'd love to <laughs> About, but uh, this has been super duper fun. And before we get to our sort of closing philosophical questions, I wonder if there's anything else that you're like particularly excited about on a personal level or things that you're thinking about all the time that maybe you want to get off your chest here before we get to our closing questions. Oh man, I don't want to make this like the the dad ultra runner podcast, but I'm pretty excited about having a little kid right now. Uh, it's been really uh, eye opening to just see outside of myself and have something on a daily basis, just like pull me out of my head and into my body and into like the present in a way that can't happen. Like it can with a toddler running around the house and you and I, I mean, yeah, privately we've chatted about this a bit, but I think it's important to like connect on that real briefly. I mean, the dad journey is real and it's, it's a lot of work and it's hard, but it's also been, uh, it's also been, yeah, like the biggest thing in my life in this last year. It's so incredible. And of course, like something you can't adequately describe in language, but I love how you said it, it brings you back into the present. And one of the things I've been experiencing recently, I mean, the last like several months have been just wildly chaotic and and stressful. And even in like the hardest hard days. Yeah. Like when I see my son smile, it's like my heart just freaking glows. And it's like, you just feel that, I don't know, it does bring you into the moment. You just sort of like recognize the simple beauty of what children are, you know, the blank canvas that they are, they're just per perfect innocence, you know, haven't been corrupted by you know, the adversity of life or, you know, they're just don't carry the same baggage or cynicism or pessimism or whatever. And so just like a simple smile from a kid who sees you walk into a room. It's just like, man, being a dad's pretty amazing. Have yeah. has that changed much? Like, I don't know. One of the things that I think about and talk about, you know, with, with other new parents is just sort of like thinking about your own family and thinking about your own kind of mortality. And, you know, at this point, seeing your parents age, your grandparents probably getting older and just, I don't know, for me, it's, it's helped me recognize my position in a much longer lineage of my family and ancestors. You know, I'm no longer the youngest generation that's alive, you know, and sort of feel, I don't know, sort of feel the presence of um, you know, thinking more about my parents and my grandparents and, and their parents and things like that. I don't know if any of that resonates with you. Yeah. Yeah, it totally does. I just feel like it gives you a, a totally different perspective. I mean, just like you were mentioning, I mean, the experience that my parents had with me, I now get to experience with my kid and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a bit of an identity shift. I mean, I'm still who I am and having a kid doesn't completely change that, but it fully adds to adds to it in a really incredible way. And yeah, what you were just mentioning about just seeing maybe Rhodes smile and, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't advocate for people to have kids. I don't like, I didn't know if I wanted to have one again, going back to indecision, Katie is the decisive one. <laughs> and I'm glad that she talked me into it. <laughs> and, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm any happier having a kid, but I definitely have, moments of joy on a daily basis, unlike I ever had before. And that's just been, um, 
really, really uh, a positive like value add to my life. And I'll say one more thing is it's cliche, but I think I want to keep doing participating in the sport of ultra running and trail running for him. And I, I mean this, and I truly mean this. I do not care if he runs. I do not care if he's a trail runner or an ultra runner. I want him to know that it's okay to attempt extraordinary things. Yep. I want him to, I want to normalize like taking really big swings in life and attempting things that are so freaking hard is okay. And if he takes that and absorbs it and uses it for something that has nothing to do with trail running, that's totally fine by me. But I just hope that I can keep doing it long enough that he can like witness that and absorb it and be like, cool. I I know how to like, it's okay to like go big and succeed and fail, but it's like the, the going big part that's important. And if he can take that into his life, then I'll have, I'll have totally succeeded. Brilliant. So maybe before we get to these final questions, just to add my color here, one of the other four values of our definition of trail culture is effort, right? And Mm. this is something that I would love to pass down to my son as well. And just like the value of just like going for something, right. And just like putting it all on the line. And it's a shame that there's probably the vast majority of the world's population goes through their entire lives without like finding that boundary or finding a boundary, you know, pushing themselves to the absolute limit, putting it all on the line, taking a big risk. And whether you succeed or fail, there's, so much value in just doing that. And I think that's one of the reasons why people love devoting their lives to this incredible sport. Absolutely. So with that spirit in mind, Mike Foote, a couple of closing questions for you. The first is, who is one person that you admire can be living or dead inside or outside of sport? And why is it that you admire that person? Oh, man. <laughs> I knew this was coming. I've thought a lot about it. Uh, And because it is our fourth wedding anniversary, I'm going to go with the low hanging fruit of my wife, Katie. And because it's also true, uh, she is, she chooses kindness over cynicism. Uh, I've like taken a lot of pride in my life of being a cynic and she has shown me that that's not, (laughs) that's not a healthy thing all the time. And that, um, you know, kindness is, uh, such a better path forward. And she, she showcases that in so many ways. She is, uh, decisive when I'm indecisive, you know, common theme in this conversation. She is, uh, she kind of like leans into discomfort in a way that I try to avoid things. Uh, she's just been such a leader in our relationship and in our, you know, young family that, I am so amazed by her and admire her. And uh, yeah, she she is the person that came to mind. And part of me was like, well, that's too easy. But on a daily she's day, badass I, too. Should, I, mean, I should, I uh, should. <laughs> well, yeah, she's, she's a nurse. She's, uh, she's like, it's done a bunch of like crab fishing up in the Bering. Oh, sea. salmon fishing. Yeah, she's, fishing. she's like a... You know, uh, she's like she, yeah, she's a nurse catch, dude. Yeah, she's totally. She's a nurse practitioner, but takes time off of her vacation time off of her job to do commercial salmon fishing in Alaska with her dad. And uh, yeah, I mean, she's just she's just amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, a person that I've learned more from than almost anybody. Yeah, she's amazing. Shout out, Katie. Final question for you, Mike. What is one truth that you've learned about yourself or about life in general through your experience as a trail runner? We've sort of touched on some of this. So if it feels yeah. redundant, we can, uh, we it can might be redundant. Yeah. Uh, and I think that I think the, that uncertainty is like the most grounded we're ever going to be. And trying to attach ourselves to an outcome or to certainty or to an answer is just holding on to things too tight. And that like, whether it's in training, racing, life, uh, holding on to things loosely and 
trying to stay in the moment with it is is definitely the best path forward and and as close as we're ever going to get to to certainty and so i think that there's something really uh comforting and like groundlessness and i i know i experienced that in in sport uh and in life so true right you know sport is an exhibition in uncertainty and uh yeah, I think it's something that we can all get better at. It's just, you know, not being so attached to how things turn out in the end and instead just be okay in the waves and in the process. So Mike Foote, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, buddy. It's great to connect with you. Congrats on the release of this new film and have a great trip to tell your end. Thanks, Dylan. Talk soon, man.